The whole money I got when I was starting was um, nine pounds. That was my saving for eight years in the police force. So I, out of these nine pounds, I bought raffia, bought drums, bought a small bicycle for one pound ten, and some costumes, and I started. He put out an advert in the uh, press asking for 30 charming ladies as actresses. 30. Can you imagine a, a new theater asking for 30 women? And uh, he got no response whatsoever. Then I put in another advertisement, uh, wanted 30 lady clerks as um, workers, Ogunde, what was it then, African Music Research Party. And then the response was tremendous. Many people came, many girls came, even boys came. When they arrived for uh, interviews, he then told them that he wanted them for, uh, you know, as actresses, so that most of them ran away. And uh, some were removed by irated parents who didn't want their girls appearing on the stage and being considered as prostitutes, which they were in those days, not so much now. Ogunde in the recording studio in Lagos, laying down tracks for his latest single. Ogunde's theatre has prospered since those early days in the 40s, and others have followed this path. Most of them, like Ogunde, have been writer-actor managers, giants in their own right. Men like the late Kola Ogumola, the late Duru Ladipo, Moses Olaya, and Oyin Adejobi. Forty years ago, there was no professional theatre in Nigeria in the strict sense of the word. Today, there are over 30 struggling travelling companies in just the Yoruba-speaking area of Nigeria alone. During those years, Ogunde's own company has constantly adapted and changed its style and subject matter. In the late 40s, for instance, the young Ogunde was influenced by the nationalism of such men as Dr. Namdi Azikwe, later to be Nigeria's first president, and Chief Obafemi Awolowo. He started to write plays that reflected the new political awareness of his time. They were really created specifically to imbibe cultural pride into the Nigerian public. Cultural pride so that they would be conscious to realize that colonial rule was, uh, continuing colonial rule was not good. In fact, when he took his play Strike and Hunger to the tin mining town of Jos, the colonial authorities reacted. And when the play started, Police came on the stage and scattered the uh, you know, uh, actors and actresses and scattered the audience and arrested Ogunde and a few of his artists as well. And of course, the nationalist press notified the whole country immediately with screeching headlines. It became a hot public debate for days. You know, their darling had been captured by these very cruel people, you know, by these colonial masters. <laughs> and this, of course, helped Ogunde immensely. Independence came in 1960, but Ogunde's clashes with the authorities didn't finish with the end of the colonial era. He continued to be critical of the new African rulers. In 64, he wrote a play called Yoruba Ronu, meaning Yoruba Think. Although set in ancient times, it was in fact a bitter comment on the then current struggle between two Nigerian politicians competing for power. Chief Obafemi Awolowo and his protege, Chief S.L. Akitola. They invited him to write a play for the inauguration of the cultural arm of their party. And he agreed. And when he put on the play, they thought he was going to show a nice cultural show on Yoruba custom. And he started attacking them. It's stories of a king who, leaving his vice regent temporarily in charge of his court, travels throughout his kingdom. But the vice regent, having been given power, has no intention of giving it up. The king is taken captive, and corruption and poverty come to his land. His bewildered subjects are left to suffer. Eventually, the gods intervene, and the king is restored to his rightful place. The 
prime premier and the ministers realized that he was attacking them and they all got up and walked out. And he continued with the play and it was immensely enjoyed by the public and the audience. And a few days later, he was banned. This time he did not go to press. It was the press that protested on his behalf. This banning order lasted right up to Nigeria's first military coup two years later. But before then, in the 50s, Ogunde had developed what was later to be called his concert party style. Again, he was responding to the people's changing mood. They wanted a theatre that concentrated a lot on jazz and uh, Western variety, you know, shows. And he had been doing this in Ghana, having his women playing the saxophone and dressed in grass skirt and big hats and really shaking their you know, figure. Uh, it was a theater that really oozes, oozed with sex appeal, which was not so in his theater of the 40s. He put onto the stage a collection of contemporary rogues, bomber boys and good time girls, talking hip and local pigeon, reflecting the easygoing morals of the new city life. Hey, which business they crack now? Uh, you mean me? No. Uh, I'm importer and exporter. Hey. I don't get beer, but I supply them beer. Yeah. Of course. That is ticket change. Ticket change. Hey, sign your name. But in the 60s, Ogunde changed direction again. The West was moving in fast. Nigerians wanted to remember and record the old ways before they were changed beyond recognition. So we return to Arukmin Tenia, written in 1964. The sad tale of the poor Efutajo, condemned to exile in the forest for having given birth to a stone. We take up the story many years later, when a strange young boy is found by the river and brought to the king's palace. Already, he has told them that his name is Uriadeki Be, meaning in Yoruba, the one born to be king. Shortly after, the king summons his people to the palace. The king's chamberlain insists that everyone should come, even poor Efotajo who is brought in from the forest by two hunters. She is so changed that people don't even recognize her. The old priestess explains the king's plan. The plan is for all the women to prepare with their own hands a stew. They will offer it to Oriade Kigbe. It is hoped that through this, he will come to know his proper mother.
Eventually, it seems Oriadeki Igbe has been shown everyone. The priestess asks him to take just one final look. So there it is. The righteous have come out on top. The wicked are to be punished. While the two elder wives are led away, Efutajo, now based and freshly dressed, returns to sing of how, with patience and honesty, we can overcome our misfortunes. A sentiment close to Ogunde's heart. In any venture, there must be problems. There must, be, there must be difficulties, and then one has to persevere in spite of uh, all odds. I think uh, this has been the reason why I have been able to be successful up to this point.